Welcome everyone to another scan.com CPD webinar. We have Professor Leonard Funk joining us this evening to talk through uh, the rotator cuff and imaging. Uh, I'm Toby Ryan, Head of Partnerships. Um, just a reminder on scan.com, uh, if you uh, take a photo of the next QR code, um, you'll be able to uh, go to the scan.com website, create your own referral account, uh, just by entering some a, a few easy details, uh, name, practice, contact details, etc. And you'll be able to start your referral process through scan.com. Um, so without further ado, next up, actually, we'll have a bit of housekeeping first. Um, uh, please keep all your questions in the chat. You'll be kept on mute um, for the evening. Uh, and then maybe at the end, we'll, we'll open up to some open discussion. But questions will be in the chat for now uh, to enable a smooth presentation. The presentation is recorded and we will be able to send you a recording afterwards. And we'll also provide you with a certificate of attendance for your CPD files. So again, without further ado, um, Professor Leonard Funk. Well, we've, we've just, before you go on to me, we've got a poll for you guys from scan.com. Um, so I think Toby or Lizzie, you, you know how to manage that. Well, the evening, everyone, it's good to see. So we're talking mostly <clears throat> to therapists, um, and it didn't look, I don't know if there were any surgeons, I might have missed it, so I can say anything about the surgery parts then. Um, good, so I'm, I'm a shoulder surgeon, and um, I fix shoulders. I'm based in um, Wrightington Hospital for my NHS, and... Um, at the Wilmslow Hospital in Manchester, um, or in Wilmslow, for uh, my private practice. Um, so let's get started as soon as I can get this to work. Um, right, okay. Ah. Okay, so I'll be talking about rotator cuff imaging and management. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know why this isn't working. Um, it says use my keyboard layout. Okay, Lizzie, help. Um, ah, okay, there we go. So what I'm going to do is discuss um, a typical patient case, um, clinical findings correlated with the imaging, how the, um, uh, how the two fit together, um, and then how we go about managing them. Um, a little plug for our book, Diagnostic Clusters and Shoulder Conditions, is from my colleague, Puneet Monga. And really what we want to do is just clarify that that standard old fashioned, you know, system is not as straightforward. It's a cluster of signs and symptoms that you put together, you know, in your head to come out with a management plan. And we go through that for all the uh, common shoulder conditions. So obviously you're going to be getting my particular approach and, and bias. You might not necessarily um, agree with everything I say, and please don't. Uh, you know, any comments, criticisms, or questions, um, please put them in the webinar chat, not the Q&A. And then what we'll do at the end of the session, um, we'll go through those questions and any other questions or comments um, that, that you guys might have. Um, it's not going to be a very long talk, um, probably half an hour. Uh, at max, unless I take tangents, which I often do. Um, so typical patient, 55-year-old guy, slip wrenched his arm, pain overhead, uh, struggling to sleep. Um, classic ones is they have to support their arm to turn a kettle or lift something up. And the pain is usually upper arm deltoid area. So on clinical examination, this is a video showing the common tests that I, I would do. And remember, as a as 
a surgeon, we're doing gross tests. We don't do the functional, more subtle tests you would do to guide um, your rehab approach. We're looking for, for big things. So um, this is just the story again, that he fell, felt a snap and severe pain. Um, he's had some rehab with no improvement. This is, I apologize, very old video. So looking, you can see he's got some supraspinatus and infraspinatus wasting on that side. So quite significant and probably chronic problem. Um, <clears throat> you can see that nicely there. So we know that there's significant uh, muscle involvement. So I normally go through a range of movement and um, doing uh, flexion and abduction and looking at uh, the scapular humeral rhythm. Here you can see he gets to mid arc on the right and he gets severe pain. External rotation, you know, again, gross external rotation is fine. I actually don't do <clears throat> that test anymore, but essentially, you know, mid arc pain is an impingement pain. That's a near sign. So he gets pain mid arc when you externally rotate, it's easier. And that, you know, I call that the Copeland test. So then for AC joint, do a scarf test, see if there's any pain. Key with the scarf test is they localize it to the AC joint. In testing abduction strength, you can do it long and short lever arm, testing external rotation power keep their arms tucked in. And with every strength test, there'll be a lag. So this is external rotation lag, and there's no lag. So that tells us that it's not complete functional loss. Um, and then always compare with the other side, and you can see I'm pivoting off um, the elbow. So that's the external rotation lag. For the posterior inferior cuff, this is more towards Terry's uh, minor, um, the hornblower's test, and you test it in strength and you test it in lag. So can you get your arm here and does it drop? So that tells you how significant the tear is posterior. If you have a positive um, <clears throat> hornblower's, it's almost certainly going to be a massive irreparable um, functional tear. Then you do the belly press tests. I also now do more tests for subscap, including the bear hug uh, test, as well as the belly press test. Um, so biceps, I like speeds test. Again, pain should be along the long head of biceps tendon. Um, so that's, that's that. See if we can move on to the next slide. Okay. Interesting. Please be patient. We have this is what happens. I'm not sharing my screen. Okay. So in terms of the accuracy of clinical examinations, it, it's poor. And you can imagine that because it's unrealistic to expect a test to be able to isolate any single structure. When you elevate your arm or you're testing resistance in abduction. You've got lots of muscle groups incorporating. You're not testing one isolated group. So the tests are helpful and they're interesting, gives us an idea of how it's affecting the patients, but they're not anatomically valid. So they're functionally symptomatically valid. They're not anatomically valid. Um, what's really helpful is your history. I always say 70% of the diagnosis comes from the history. It's key really knowing, have they had an injury? What was the injury? How, what's their pain like? How has the pain changed? Is it mechanical pain? Is it persistent pain? Um, how does it affect them functionally? And what has been their response to therapies, rehab, what type of rehab, how they've responded to it, and um, any injections and other therapies. And you put that all together. 
We then move on to imaging and what sort of imaging and, uh, and why. So plain x-rays will only tell us about the bones and the joints. They're not going to tell us much more than that. Ultrasound scan will only tell us superficial structures. It's not going to tell us anything more than that. An MRI scan will show us all the structures, the bones, the soft tissues. But again, a caveat here, it depends on the MRI scan. Not all MRI scans are created equally. There's huge variations. And in my opinion, it often correlates with the cost of the scan. Um, the um, x-rays uh, that we'd like to have is an AP, an axial, and it's very helpful with cuff disease is a supraspinatus outlet view. Um, so particularly what you'll see on the outlet view uh, and all of these is perhaps if there's calcium in the tendon, you see the acromiohumeral space, you can see uh, the shape of the acromion, the AC joint and alignment. On the AP, you get, again, the acromiohumeral gap, any changes in the glenohumeral joint and AC joint as well. On the um, axial, main, the commonest thing is looking if there is any osochromiale, uh, but also a great view for the um, glenohumeral joint. Ultrasound scan is very convenient. It's quick, you can do it in your clinic, um, but um, it is very much operator dependent. Um, and like I said, only superficial structures. So this is this patient's ultrasound scan. And um, so um, this is here looking long head of biceps, tendon. Um, so I assume some of you here do ultrasound scans. Um, on the coronal um, scan, you can see he's got this irregularity in the tuberosity, and he's got a large uh, tear measuring there at 2.5 centimeters. And this is moving front to back, and you can see that's almost certainly got the appearances of a chronic um, supraspinatus rotator cuff tear. Um, if we look on the sagittal or transverse sequences, you can see from front to back, it's about 2.7 centimeters in size. And again, it's going from front to back, so we can have a proper look at it. Probably this ultrasound quality is a lot poorer than you're used to. That was my portable scan almost 20 years ago, actually. Um, and then what we'll do is have a look at the, the joint rotating and the posterior cuff at the back. Um, MRI scans, certainly less user dependent. It can be looked at, at later on as well. Um, it's a lot more accurate for larger tears where you can see under the acromion. It's also better for partial cuff tears. You can see all associated pathologies. Um, and very importantly, from a surgical point of view, we want to look at the muscle atrophy and fatty infiltration because that will influence our prognostication and decision making. Um, so this is showing you on the T1 sequences, the, the muscle quality that we look for. So that's good muscle quality in that case. Um, so we break up the, oh, these were, uh, and these were hidden slides, but this is not stuff I think you guys need to know, but hopefully you do. So um, in terms of the MRI scan, we, we will look at things that influence our management, such as the size of the tear. Um, I like the Cofield classification, which is uh, the, their small, medium, large, or massive. Uh, we look at the position of the tear, so which zone it's in, because that will again influence uh, management. That's harbor mass classification. Um, the shape of the tear, uh, which you can usually um, tell by whether the um, uh, conjoint band uh, is intact or not. So the anterior supraspinatus thickened tendon, if that's intact, 
then it's a U and it's behind that, it's a U tear. If it's not intact, it's probably an L shaped tear. Um, the level of retraction. So this is Pate's classification. Again, obviously the worse that is, the less repairable the tear is. Um, and then looking at uh, the muscle atrophy and fatty infiltration, and we use a four-stage grading system called Guatelier. Um, another one that, that we use nowadays is the position of the humeral head on the coronal sequences, um, and that's the Hamada grading system, obviously. And that's a four-stage system, and the worse it is, the less repairable it is. Um, in terms of the MRI scans, remember I said that they're not all the same. A lot of the scans that patients sometimes come with that they've got done um, through their GPs or, or they've got done through, um, uh, through other systems, they come with very limited scans. So they'll choose three or four sequences and do them. And I, I call those scans screening scans because they low quality and um, they will only show big pathologies and they don't give all the information that we need for clinical decision making. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes if patients are self-funding, they're not very happy when they have to then pay for a second scan. But essentially what, what I need and like is what I call the full six pack. So it includes a T1 axial, which is important for the bony pathology. In fact, it's seven now, the seventh's missing. Um, so we do a bone enhancing sequence. I forget what it's called, but there's a bone enhancing sequence as well. Um, the T1 coronals, which will help us look at the muscle quality and fatty infiltration. T1 sagittals is very important for uh, muscle atrophy because uh, we know that if it's, um, if it, it has, and the other thing, it has to extend medial to the scapula Y because we know that if the atrophy is below the line between the scapular spines, then um, that's uh, significant and has a poor prognostication. Um, the T2 coronals um, uh, with fat suppression, so generally a, a stir type uh, sequence, and um, that's helpful to look at the AC joint, the bursa, um, and any edema or inflammation. So if you see a very inflamed AC joint, then I, that would probably be some symptomatic and address that. Same with the T2 um, axial sequences, very helpful for the AC joint because it's not uncommon to have AC joint, associated AC joint pathology. Um, and then the, the fat sat sagittals, uh, very much uh, the same idea as well, um, but gives us the three dimensional. So this is his scans. Um, you can see that the starting off with T1s. Um, Oh, sorry, while well, you read that. So this is the T1 sequences. Um, and here we're looking at some axial sequences. Again, these this quality is unacceptable nowadays. Um, but I'm sorry, this is the patient that I've got. So you see those are, um, so here, this is what we're looking for. So looking at the muscle, muscle atrophy, you see it's not too bad, probably a Guatelier 2. The humeral head is well centered, which is Hamada 1 or 2. On the um, fat suppression coronals, you can see there's a lot of fluid in the bursa, but the AC joint is okay. Fluid down the bicep sheath, um, and that's what we're looking for there. Okay, so in terms of decision making, um, you know, we, we say we treat the man, not the scan. 
Um, there are many people out there who have asymptomatic rotator cuff tears. I've got one in my right shoulder, um, all minimally symptomatic, and they can live with it. Um, so the relationship between the symptoms and the fact that there's an anatomical rotator cuff tear is not um, a robust association. Um, so we say, you know, treat, treat the man, not the scan. Tear does not equal repair. And that's a hard thing for patients to understand um, because for them, a tear is a rip, which is a bad term we use. Um, so in terms of um, the treatments, uh, there's a couple of great big studies on rotator cuffs. One, uh, multi-center studies, one in the USA, which is the Moon Shoulder Group. And then in the UK, there's been the U-Cuff study. And we've got lots of excellent um, broad data um, on cuff management from these studies. It's not perfect, but you know it's excellent large multi-center data. So the Moon Group, showed that with a home-based non-operative program, 75% of patients were symptom-free at five years. So compared with the operative group, it was 89%. So essentially, yes, you can manage rotator cuff tears non-operatively and they can do well. Um, what um, the UCUF study showed was because of the drop-off rate from the non-operative group, they then did another study to look at why were patients dropping off the non-operative group so quickly. And there were multiple factors for that, but essentially it was the severity and uh, duration of the symptoms uh, that uh, pushed them more towards operative management. So essentially, a, a trial of non-operative management in patients who are very symptomatic and have already had some type of non-operative management do well with further non-operative management. Um, steroid injections uh, used with caution. Steroid is proteolytic. It damages proteins. Steroid is only an anti-inflammatory. It's nothing more than that. It'll only reduce inflammation. So therefore, the place for steroid injections is if you're trying to reduce inflammation to aid rehab or for some reason, but it's not a treatment in itself for rotator cuff tears. And be careful because steroids being proteolytic can uh, deteriorate the quality of the rotator cuff tendon, um, making the tendons bigger or even irreparable. Uh, the studies do show, not just the UCAF, that earlier surgery tends to give better outcomes than later surgery as well. Then we've got to look at um, which patients will do well with surgery? What are the prognosticators? So this is a student of ours in 2014 who did a meta-analysis, and um, he found that um, these were the independent factors determining uh, outcomes. So age, tear size, fatty infiltration, smoking is a big one, the chronicity, how long they've had the tear for, um, obesity and other comorbidities as well, and independent factors. Um, the UCUF study came off, came on after that, and this the big multi-center study showed that the two major factors by far was age and size of tear, and they came up with this fantastic chart, chart to show the um, healing rate of tears based on age and size of tear. So you can certainly see that the older the patient, the larger the tear, the much, much lower chance of uh, a repair healing is. So this was big factors in our decision-making for repairs. 
So whether to repair a tear is really multifactorial. There's the patient factors, which we've discussed earlier. There's the tear factors. So all the things that we look for on an MRI scan, like the fatty infiltration, the Hamada humeral head position, um, the retraction, the associated pathologies, and uh, uh, if there's any glenohumeral arthritis, then also it depends on the surgeon, their skills, facilities, and equipment. Um, the big ones to be aware of really are smokers, uh, long-term steroid use, multiple steroid injections, stiffness, arthritis, um, and to add another one now, which over the last five to 10 years has become more prevalent, osteoporosis. So generally, any uh, female and often males over the age of 70, I'll get a bone density scan before uh, considering surgery and some females over 60. Um, so uh, there's, there's a website um, that I set up for uh, patients, my, for my patients, which you can have a look at called shoulderdoc.co.uk. All this information and lots more is on there. And someone's added a little scan me thing, QR code. Um, so um, any questions? I see we've got one. So thank you very much. And move on to questions, comments, and criticisms. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Professor Funk. Um, yeah, first Len. question from Joanne. Yeah, so how many steroid injections do you feel is reasonable for subacromial bertitis with a subacromial enthosophite and calcific tendonitis? Well, okay, so in that calcific tendonitis is the primary pathology there. Um, the uh, An enthesophyte can be normal. We know that. That in itself is not necessarily a pathology. Um, the bursitis is probably secondary to the calcific tendonitis. So the, 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 the answer is, um, if you're in your primary practice, one injection and assess the response. Um, the, all the injection will do will settle the subacromial bursitis. It's not going to uh, get rid of the calcific tendonitis. So you've always got to think with any treatment, what are you trying to achieve? So one steroid injection, if that improves their pain and they never come back again, fantastic. The key there is going to be the rehab. So with um, uh, the, well, it's a big answer here, but one of the causes of pain from calcific tendonitis is an impingement pain due to cuff dysfunction. So your treatment will need to be in addition to the steroid injection, targeted rehab to bring the humeral head down and centralize it to stop it impinging. So postural work, scapular work, retraction, activity modifications. Um, the uh, calcific tendonitis causes pain in other ways. So it causes a pressure pain in the tendon. So subacromial injection, the burst is gonna make no difference for that pressure pain. Um, the other uh, way it causes pain is through the calcium leaking. If it leaks into the bursa, yes, the steroid injection will temporarily help. If it leaks into the joint, it's gonna make very little uh, difference um, at all. So one injection, and treat the calcific tendonitis if it's symptomatic. So I hope that answered your question. What percentage of your patients do you operate? Uh, my conversion to surgery is 8%. So this is something that people don't get. They, they think if you're seeing a surgeon, you're going for surgery. It's not. If you see a surgeon, you're going for a surgical opinion. So most, a uh, vast majority of my uh, patients is non-operative management. Um, because middle age, non-traumatic shoulder pain, which is the commonest by far, will, doesn't need surgery. 
it can be treated non-operatively. Young athletes with trauma different. Um, on your examination, do you see atrophy on the rotator cuff that are not affected as much as the affected rotator cuff tendon as a compensation? No. No. Um, as a rule, the atrophy is normally the affected tendon with the pathology. If um, you see um, atrophy in a tendon with in a muscle with a with no tendon pathology, you might think a chronic neurological problem rather than a tendon problem. And I hope that answered your question. Oh, I love this. They're coming fast. Oh, hi, Kate. If I see a patient as a physio, and you'll probably see my patients as a physio, um, uh, and I suspect a partial cuff tear that is very irritable, assuming I'm not responding well to rehab, would you recommend to a GP in ultrasound scan prior to steroid injection? Due to reducing inflammation. Um, what's that? Well, I recommend an ultra. I mean, it depends. It depends on the patient's symptoms, and it depends on availability. Um, I an ultrasound scan will only tell you is there a tear or not, or is there calcium or not. Um, so, um, if that's what you want to know, then fine, do an ultrasound scan. If you're convinced that somebody has a bursitis and impingement um, and, uh, um, and the pain is affecting the quality of life, as a screening investigation, an X-ray would be better because that would exclude the serious worrying pathologies, albeit rare, um, and then uh, do a steroid injection to assist with the rehab. I hope that answers your question. So, so no, I wouldn't necessarily recommend an ultrasound scan, but I'd certainly, if if you're going to be treating any shoulder as a rule, I would say generally at least have an X-ray or some or, or an MR scan. Um, okay, uh, Joan Murphy, having done a course with Joe Gibson, says neuromuscular rehab is very important. If you have no real rotator cuff weakness, sometimes it seems kind to work on increasing drought. What rehab do you feel works best with rotator cuff dysfunction without weakness? Um, so I don't necessarily, I'm no expert here, but I'm not sure whether neuromuscular rehab means just increasing strength. I think it's a lot more than that. Um, so um, the difficulty with weakness is the weakness may not be something that you can just pick up on testing strength. Like I said, if you're testing strength, multiple muscles can compensate. But we know if somebody has rotator cuff disease, the rotator cuff's role to centralize, so the neuromuscular centralization effect of the rotator cuff is really important. It's not its role in strength. It's its role in controlling the humeral head. And my guess is that's what she means. So um, I don't think um, strengthening alone is the way to go. Um, but neuromuscular rehab, yes. Um, so what rehab do I feel works best for rotate? Well, uh, so without weakness, folk, so... Focused rotator cuff exercises, centralizing the humeral head, uh, seeing if when you centralize the humeral head, does that improve their symptoms? Um, scapular correction, uh, postural control, activity modifications, ergonomics, anti-inflammatories. Um, so I hope that answers that. Sarah Kinsella. What are the treatment options for calcifying tendonitis when shockwave and two power treatments have failed? Surgery. Um, I hope that answers the question, Sarah. Surgery. Um, that's the option. Doesn't mean they have to have it because uh, calcium is 
calcific tendonitis ultimately is self-limiting, but it can take 10 to 15 years to go away by itself. So surgery has a success rate of over 96% in patients like that. Um, Nigel Atten, thank you. Oh, I have to leave now. Okay, bye, Nigel. He's probably gone. What would you think causes a lot of clicking at the shoulder when a patient takes a deep breath? What do you think causes a lot of clicking at the shoulder? I think taking a deep breath uh, caused the clicking. Okay, Michael Smith, I've had a few frozen shoulder patients who had consultants partially anesthetize them and subluxate the joint. Do you employ, oh, you're talking about MUA? No, I don't do MUAs. Um, uh, would, a lot of surgeons tend to do a capsular release now, uh, arthroscopic capsular release. It's a more controlled release. The problem with the subluxate the joint or the MUA is that it's uncontrolled and you can get uh, complications with it. But, um, you know, the studies show great results with MUAs, but it, Arthroscopic capsular release is a more controlled operation, and you can also assess the intra-articular structures. Um, so I hope that answers the uh, question. Um, Joan Murphy, by neuromuscular control, she was showing us exercises which involve the lower limb stepping forward to bring up. Okay, she's worked on. Yes, she has worked on a booklet with me. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I'm not a physiotherapist, so I can't really help you much further with, with that neuromuscular control. But yes, our book is uh, on shoulder exercises to assist physios, and it's available free on shoulder.co.uk. Um, Sarah Kinsella, sorry, calcific ten nice to follow up. What surgery you offer for this? Uh, yes, removal of the calcified bits, that's correct, Sarah. It's a keyhole operation, excision of calcium. Look on shoulderdoc.co.uk under calcific tendonitis. It's all there. Uh, oh, John. Hi, John. Oh, a lot of familiar face and names here. Uh, sorry you had to listen to me again. Would there need to be serious consideration of bone health density when going through shoulder replacement surgery before? Uh, absolutely, in um, high-risk patients, um, definitely uh, bone density scans are helpful. To be honest with you, um, my colleagues who do complex shoulder arthroplasty don't generally do it because they um, are so used to dealing with osteoporotic um, bones uh, all the time, so they won't... Uh, necessarily do bone density scans um, as a routine, but certainly for rotator cuff surgery, um, I tend to. Oh, that was brilliant. Lots of great questions, especially the clicking when they take a deep breath. That looks like to, to, Toby. Is that a, is that okay? Yeah, I think that was fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, there's more. There's more. I'm loving this. Yeah, uh, Leslie, oh. thanks. Post-op rotated cuff. What is your initial restrictions? Um, no lifting anything heavier than a cup of tea for the first um, four weeks. Um, wear the sling when out and about, and for sleeping for the first three weeks. Otherwise, they can use their arm as comfortable. So that's it. That's the restrictions. Um, brilliant. Lots of thank you. So few people managed to stay awake to the end. Uh, good. And then Michael Smith, every patient worries about clicking with scalp. Can I assume calcific under soap? Okay. I don't, do you understand that, Toby? Not sure what soap is, to be honest. I think it's a typo of scap. Assume, no, you don't get calcific under scap. Calcific is in, in the rotator cuff tendons. 
clicking with scapular movement is called a snapping scapula. Look it up on shoulder dock. Snapping scapula, that's what snapping under the scapula is. The, there's multiple causes for snapping scapula. It's on shoulder dock or Google. Right. Really? Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Professor Funk. Um, if anyone's got any questions about scan.com, please don't hesitate to reach out to me.